Now, your ideas don't have to wait. Now, they have everything they need to come to life. Dell Technologies and Intel are creating technology that loves ideas, loves expanding your business, evolving your passions. We push what technology can do so great ideas can happen right now. Find out how to bring your ideas to life at dell.com slash welcome to now. Who's with me? Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it's time to get back to the basics with your money. Here to share her story is co-founder and CEO of Bixie, an app that is aimed at getting women to capitalize on their investable income, Rosalia Gital. And now... Two guys who complete each other. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. And a happy Wednesday to you, stackers. Hey there, I am Joe Saul Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And a special episode today, OG. We get to, uh, well, you get to just put your feet up and listen because as Doug so uh, how's that said, any different than uh, any of my other episodes <laughs> it's, it's true yeah well we, we usually come to you a lot more but today Rosalia and I spoke on the fireside app for about 45 to 50 minutes and it was so good Karen our esteemed producer Karen Rapine and I went what do we do with all this and then we thought this was so good there's so many takeaways OG that we thought we'd play it in its entirety because it's a, it's a great interview. So, yeah, it is a little bit different there. But you having a good uh, good week? Yeah, it just got better. I can just chill now. Do I get? <laughs> Duh. I mean, do we get paid the same? I'm just curious. Like, I mean, not that that would decide whether or not I participate today, but just so we're clear, well, I do get paid the same. We do get paid the same as long okay. as we have uh, this happen right here. U.S. Cellular has some great news, especially for you, person listening to this podcast. Right now, you can get one line with unlimited data for just $29.99. So unlike other cell networks, you won't have to pay for lines you don't need just to get a good price. Get one line for $29.99 with unlimited data today. U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Visit uscellular.com for details. Well, actually, I lied. We got to have this, too. Well, Navy Federal Credit Union is here to help military members and their families tackle homeownership during this high rate market with their new no refi rate drop option. Listen to this. This is so cool because the way the amortization tables work, every time you do a refinance, all that money that you paid to banks really adds up. Like when you refinance a loan, it wasn't the interest rate. The, the The rate that you paid was not the rate that you think you paid. That's if you pay over this 30-year or 15-year time frame that they say. No, lenders get their money up front. The amortization table works very much in their favor. So you might have paid 20, 30, 40%. Heck, if you look at the early years of your mortgage, you're paying a lot more than that, which is why I love the new no refi rate drop option. This is cool. If you buy your next home now, and the mortgage rates drop later, you could lower your rate by paying a low fee instead of refinancing and paying thousands of dollars of closing cost on top of all of the interest that you paid out, like I had mentioned earlier. They offer mortgage options with zero down payment, so you don't need to wait years to save. Also, planning any travel this summer, Navy Federal Flagship Credit Card treats members to our highest rewards and premium benefits. Flagship makes it easy to rack up rewards with higher points on travel, including everything from tolls to terminals. So if you pay your credit card bill in full, Navy Federal Flagship Credit Card is the way to go. You'll earn a bonus of 40,000 points when you spend $4,000 in the first 90 days, plus enjoy a free year of Amazon Prime. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Federally insured by NCUA. Membership required. Equal housing lender. Terms and conditions apply. Loan subject to approval and eligibility requirements. Coming up next, <laughs> Rosalia Gatow is an attorney, an author, humanitarian. She 
is the founder and CEO of the fintech firm Bixi. You know, on Monday, we talked to the amazing Michael Gilmore, who talked about Zen and money. One of the one of the 50 million cool things Michael Gilmore has done during his career was he created these huge awards in fintech called the Money Awareness and Inclusion Awards. And Rosalia was the first one OG to win two of them. She's had lots of creators that have won one, but Bixi won two different awards. And what's interesting about Rosalia is that she had to, in her words, emancipate herself from her, her dad at 14 years old. Wow. She was on her own at 14 and she's got one heck of a story. It just, the, the amazing stories, OG, that we see from people like Rosalia that are so inspirational. If Rosalia, with all the things that have happened in her life, can do it, uh, you definitely can too. So let's listen in. This is uh, me and Rosalia Gatow. Now, we talked to the creator of the MAIA Awards. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way, on winning two awards. That's never happened before. You are the first person to do that. But I'll play a clip from Michael Gilmore and what he says about you, the creator, in just a few oh minutes. Yes, he's, he's got some words about you. He told me two things. He said, this is really... It's about other people. It's about financial inclusion, but it also is about your own personal story. So let's start there. Tell me about yeah. you growing up because you have a different path that you took growing up than a lot of our stackers had. Yeah, I have uh, oh, so many things were unorthodox about my upbringing, but I'll start, I'll begin at the beginning. So my parents are from Kenya and the Philippines, respectively, and they were immigrants. They were migrants, workers to America. And they met in the States, they went to university together, and then they subsequently had my older sister and me in America, and then my younger sister in the Philippines. My family was very much en route to living the migrant American dream, right? They did their studies, they worked really hard. My mother was a nurse, so a Filipino nurse, and my father was an engineer, and everything was kind of on track on that middle class path. They bought a house, etc. And then one thing basically derailed everything. My mother at 36 years old was diagnosed with terminal cervical cancer. Oh my. Yeah. And so that changed the entire trajectory of our lives. How old, and how old were you at that point? Yeah. When she was diagnosed, I was three. You and when three. she died, it was the day after my fifth birthday. So I was really young. Do you remember but that day? Was, I'm sorry. Do you remember that I, day? Oh, no, of course. Yeah, yeah. I remember I have a daughter right now and she's 18 months old. And it terrifies me all the time because I remember everything. I remember when she was well. I remember when she was sick. She spent a year at a hospital in California and I visited every day. I remember everything. And so when I have experiences, interactions with my daughter, I'm always, that's top of mind that sure, she's 18 months old, but she could pull these all the way back. So that's quite an experience. But I don't know why my mother had this foresight. I'm guessing it's because her mother, who also happens to be named Rosalia, so my, the, the matriarch of our family is a 95-year-old Filipina woman who has lived through two world wars, two global pandemics, and three occupations in the Philippines. Wow. And she is still standing. Her birthday was yesterday. Wow. So your, grandma's, guessing, your grandma's a badass. She's basically the original badass pixie. Like, <laughs> there, there's nobody, nothing can touch this woman. I, her birthday was yesterday, so happy birthday, Inang. And she is 95 years old, and she is going strong, my friends. And my mother had the foresight at 35, 34 years old to buy life insurance because one of her Filipina friends had said, oh, this is something you should do when you have a child. So that was one of her first, aside from buying a house and things like this, this is her first foray into financial product investments. I am so lucky that she did because who thinks they're actually going to die in their mid thirties, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think about that. So for all you parents out there. If you don't have life insurance, go get life insurance because you never know. And so, yeah, it turns out that she did end up needing that life insurance. And that life insurance proved to be a true lifeline for me and my sisters. Following the demise of my mother, it was very difficult for my father and our family, very, very much fractured after that. And we were kind of splintered all around the world. Like I was... I was kind of, I sometimes I describe it as like flying around like a plastic bag, but I was thrown from like living in the Philippines and then having to move to Kenya and then moving back to America. And I came back to the U.S. at 14 years old. And this is where my story gets 
particularly unorthodox. Well, actually, years, actually, even before we get there, I want to go back to life insurance for just a moment. Yeah. Do you know if there was any real catalyst for your mom to make that decision? Was it random? Did she hear an advertisement? Like, it's so cool that she did, because to your point, so many people don't realize what a game changer one yeah. one decision like that can make, which yeah. frankly, what is it, a 10 minute decision, a 20 minute decision, maybe? Yeah. Absolutely. What I do know, I don't know the specifics of it, but she learned about it from one of her Filipina friends who was also a nurse. So she learned about it through her network. And that's actually to tie it into Bixie. And this isn't a Bixie plug, but this is how Bixie came about. Women, we know that women behave very differently when it comes to investments. And we know that triggering us to do something about it is actually more successful if it comes from our friends rather than a financial expert. Wow. And so my mother was emblematic of that, right? So she did hear about it from a friend and then the friend had, was, had done it. So she did it too. It just kind of made sense in that context. So then, as I was mentioning, the, unorth yeah. the really unorthodox 14 years happened. old, yeah. I'm 14 years old and I'm living in the U.S. And I... I, as I mentioned, my family really fractured after this. So I become legally emancipated. I'm legally on my own at 14 years old. I had $200 in my pocket. <laughs> and very luckily, because my mother had had this life insurance, there was a trust of this life insurance that was available to help pay for my education and like basic cost of living things, right? Like there was a trustee attached to it, et cetera. So I couldn't just go shopping. No, it had to be for very discreet purposes related to like my survival and education. But without that, this, my, I don't even know where my life would have gone. Like if my mother had not made that yeah. extremely prescient decision. So, and, and the same applies to my younger sister. So I ended up being able to be a 14 year old to live on my own. I was subsequently able to go to undergrad, shout out to UCLA, go Bruins. I did my master's <laughs> subsequently. And then I even got my law degree in New York and my little sister was the same. Like she's also ended, went through all the school and became an attorney as well. And so it was this common thread. You just don't know how life is going to turn out. And that is why we have investment products. So I, I really think of basic things, even like life insurance, but as investments as not luxuries. I really think of them as like first lines of survival because you don't know if you're going to live forever. You don't know if you're gonna, your job is going to disappear. That I mean, we're living in those times right now where a lot of people, especially millennials, we know all about job loss. But if you don't have money working for you somewhere in the background, you could find yourself in extreme precarity but to the point of life and death. And yeah. so that's kind of how I was really inspired by Bixie. But then after, so I go to do all the school, I build a professional career. I'm an attorney living in New York and then in Paris and I joined the UN. I was well, a even, UN worker. For even before that, I, I've got yeah. so many questions that I don't want to go too far <laughs> ahead. At 14 years old, who did you live with then? I lived with my older sister at the time was engaged and I ended up being a foster dog child of her mother-in-law. Oh, wow. So I lived with her for two years and then I moved to Spain. I convinced everybody, including my trustee, that I should go and move to Spain and do like high school in Spain, which I did. And I lived with a Spanish family for then the subsequent two years. And they are still very much part of my lives. And this is the 1990s. Like, this is before there was the European Union. Yeah. I was living in, like, Valencia, Spain, where nobody spoke English. Oh, but, um, but still, and, I was just there, Rosalia. That place is heaven. Oh, yeah? That place is heaven. It's heaven. In Valencia? Yes. I was there, like, three weeks ago. It's <laughs> amazing. Let's go back. Let's go there now. Okay, I'm going to have to send you some photos. I was a fayetta. Like I had, I don't know if you saw that festival in Silicon March, like where they burn the effigies. I, it, yeah, I saw I was, the pictures in a museum because yeah. we, yeah, it's incredible. I was that one, except like they had never seen, they'd never met a person who wasn't Catholic in the 1990s in Spain. So, <laughs> so it was like, I was from like outer space. You're the outlier. <laughs> I have for all of our stackers hanging out with us, I have never been to a town. <laughs> Texarkana, Texarkana Rosalia smells like the paper mill, which by the way, you walk outside and it, it is not, some mornings it's not pretty. So Texarkana is the first <laughs> town. I, yeah, Texarkana is the first town I ever lived in that smelled. Valencia Every morning we walk out, it smells so beautiful because of all the oranges and the blossoms. Like this town. And the light. 
it's it's the light is really beautiful. Yeah, it is just yes. heaven. It smells great. It looks good. anyway. Yes. So you went. No, no, what did, you know what? It ties in well to what we're talking about because Valencia is one of those cities that's extremely affordable. So for those of you who are like fire people, that is a great place because it's a it's a big city, like all the amenities of the modern world, but it's it's, it's affordable. So that's a great place for those who are in the the fire movement. Oh, those of you who are interested in that, fantastic. Um, yeah, a lot of yeah. people make that move, and then Portugal as well, which I've never been to Portugal. Exactly. So yeah. you must have gone there too when you were in high school, I would imagine. I didn't go to Portugal in high school. I was in a normal Spanish high school. In your third year of high school, you have a trip. So my class voted between going to Italy or going to Amsterdam, Paris, and Belgium. And you can just guess what a bunch of 16-year-olds opted to do. <laughs> <laughs> And that is where we ended up. <laughs> so, so Amsterdam was fantastic. I mean, in the 80s, it was booming, let's just say. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or the 90s. So. Yes. So I didn't mean to derail you. I do want to ask this, though. You had that early financial lesson, but during this time when you're largely parent-less or you've got parent handoffs happening all the time, did you get any real money lessons during that period of your life? Absolutely. Actually, I think I got quite a number because I was exposed to people who handled their finances very differently. Mm. So my father was very entrepreneurial. So this is before globalization. He was building businesses, cross-border businesses everywhere across Africa and Asia, a lot of like import export. When I, he did often ask me to travel with him, but it was in large part to be like a currency mule because each person is allowed to carry like 10,000 us dollars. I'm not kidding. Like these are some of my early memories. I was Carrying ten thousand US dollars in my backpack that was like purple, as you as do. one does. <laughs> this is before ATMs existed, folks. I know all about that life. I learned how to change currencies in different countries before I was twelve. Like he, one time he like left me in Japan for a week, and this is this is the eighties. I had a Game Boy, and I had I had a few hundred US dollars and the hotel, and I had to figure out like how I was going to do all of it. That's a very very distinct way of managing money. He's very high risk and that was very entrepreneurial. And then when I was kind of handed off to live with my grandmother in the Philippines, she's much more like, so my grandparents have had a rice farm for hundreds of years, right? And so they manage their money and their finances based on harvest. So it's a lot of savings, investments, insurance. So a much more conservative approach. And to my grandmother's credit, she sent six children and six grandchildren through university. And the farm still pays for everything to this day. Like they, she knows how to make money work for her, regardless of seasonalities. I, I really value those lessons. And my grandfather was always about the hard work. Like there is a reason I still to this day wake up at five o'clock in the morning. My grandfather woke up at four, like he had to go and manage the crews at the rice field. So I, I think a really good grounded work ethic comes from them. Whereas my dad was much more like entrepreneurial and charisma and all of that. And then being handed over to my foster mother, she was the only American parent I'd ever lived with. So much more American, straightforward, middle-class buy a house, do those things. So it was a very middle-class yeah. background. And so I really could understand that as well. And what was interesting is also looking at the risk aversion of the three very different influences on finances that I had. One was super high risk, high reward. One was somewhere in the middle and one was very conservative. So I knew that I had to figure out my own story because at the end of the day, and this is for better or worse, you kind of have to ask yourself, who, whose life do you want, right? Especially as, as a young person. As a young person, I was always looking for like, okay, who's like, looks like they have something figured out, right? Like they seem to be okay financially. They have loving relationships. They don't seem like a horrible person. Unfortunately, as we know, our world lacks many heroes. There are few and far between of these. But I was very lucky because then I think this also was a big influence. When I got to UCLA, I got into this small 12 person seminar and it was taught by none other than Warren Christopher, the U.S. Secretary of State. Oh, under Bill Clinton. really? Yeah. And he ended up being my mentor for decade and a half up until he passed away when I was working at the UN when he was passed away. So it was like 2011. And he really, he shaped a lot of my worldview. He was a brilliant, brilliant person, like 
like shirt people. <laughs> he was an elegant person. He had a wonderful relationship with his family. And he just, he embodied so many things that I was looking for. And so I literally just asked him one day in the seminar, and this is how our very long mentor relationship began. I was like, tell me how you did all of this. Like, just give me the magical formula. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And he's like, okay. And he just like listed it out. He's like, you're going to go to law school. You're going to join the state department, but you're going to make all of your money from the private sector. Don't ever make your money from the public sector. And then once you make enough money, you're going to go back to the public sector and you're going to contribute. That's like the magical formula. And I was like, okay, let's just do that. And I literally, I followed the, because I needed a role model and he seemed to be pretty good at it at life. And so I did what he instructed. I right out of school, I got an internship at the state department and then I got into law school and then I was a private lawyer and then I joined the UN after that. And then now I'm on this fintech and entrepreneurial journey because I just, I felt like, okay, I don't want to make my money from the public sector. Yeah, I, I want to do it from the private sector. And I very much see myself going back inevitably afterwards to contribute. But I think that he, he basically was like, he was the first person to think about money and finances from a position of like, how do you want to construct your life as opposed to money and finances being the thing that you have to like figure out in order to have a life. Mm. So even though I technically had come from this background where I should have been very risk averse, I should have been kind of scarcity mindset. I made a decision after meeting after meeting him that I was going to go after the things that I really wanted, even if they didn't make fiscal sense. And part of that was I got a butt ton of student loans. Like I had, I took out a butt ton of student loans. I was your classic millennial. Thank God UCLA in the early 2000s was $4,000 a year. Like right. does anybody even... Right. <laughs> Can anyone relate to that anymore? No, they can't. No, and then <laughs> no, and just to stop there, I mean, I often hear older people complain about younger people and their student loans. I'm like, it's a different world now. You do not understand what they're going through. You do not get it. You do not. And it's really, it's like, you don't have a choice. And I did not have much of a choice because I knew education was the only way I was going to be able to build my future. So UCLA luckily was really inexpensive. I had 17 jobs. I was a waitress. I was a tutor, whatever. I figured that out. Well, well, well you know why you only had 17 jobs was because you were the underachiever in your family waking up at 5 a.m. instead of four. Right. You know? when you, <laughs> exactly. When, when you're the underachiever because you only wake up at five, you don't have 20 yeah, jobs. You I'm, only have 17. I'm lazy. I wake up at five and I usually take a day off once a week. Like I just, you can't make me work on a Saturday. You just can't guys. Slacker, <laughs> slacker. Yeah. And yeah, so then I, I, and then grad school was paid for. I got a scholarship to that. So that was good. I did my master's in the UK at the London School of Economics, but law school people, that's what just, it got me. I mean, quarter million dollars in debt, but there wasn't really a choice. You, I wanted to go to, I needed to go to a top law school. And so I did and then walked out with that. And of course, like you get job offers and ostensibly they're supposed to be paying you a lot, but you know, there's taxes and then there's the reality of things. And, and so I kind of like fast forward to my professional life on paper, I was making a lot of money. Like on paper, I was making the kind of money that people would think, well, you're rich then. And it's like, <laughs> but like minus the taxes and the student loans and the da -da 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 -da. no, not really. And I got to this point. I was a. Uh, I I'd left the law firm. They were very and my law firm was super wonderful and generous and let me kind of go back and forth between them and the UN for many years. And then eventually I went to the UN and. And then I was kind of mid career at the UN and had risen to like a pretty senior position and was very financially like set on paper. But I remember at this point, I was like, I really want to work in tech. I really want to make another jump. I really want to pursue my passions, not just my passion. The thing that I had been working on, even when I was at the UN, was always on figuring out how to get women more financially empowered. Like that was always the common arc. And so I, I was looking and I was like, gosh, I really want to do this. Being in my mid thirties at that point, I was in my mid thirties. I still had a quarter million dollars in student loan debt. And I sat down and I was like, let me just look at my finances and my situation and see, like, can I make this entrepreneurial leap? And the numbers were not great. The numbers weren't great. And that really got me started on like, how did I, how did I, with all this education, who technically made all this money, 
like, how did I end up in a position where like, I couldn't pursue the things I wanted to because, because my finances were in the way. And because like this debt yoke, the debt yoke was such that you need to just work for somebody else for the rest of your life and then die. And that just didn't really sit well with me. So I, I decided that was the day I was like, I don't know anything about money. Nobody ever sat me down. I don't know anything. But I do know that I, I really want to change my life and I need to be able to afford it. That was kind of the beginning of the journey that now we've kind of structured at Bixie, which is like the first step is an autopsy. You've got to look at like the carnage around you. And I just like opened an Excel sheet and I was like, okay, like ears. All. And luckily I was never, I've never really been a major consumer. So I didn't have credit card debt and all that, but I did have a huge student loan debt that I would like kind of not look at. Right. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to just think the, about it. Put the blinders on. <laughs> if I if I don't look at it, maybe it'll go away. Like that's yes. always a great strategy, isn't it? It worked for years. Like all I was doing was like, like a fool making minimum payments. And I'm saying this with much love to all the audience because I know. So I did my master's in behavioral economics where we study human behavior. There is a reason why we all go like this when we look at our debt. It's not because we're bad people. It's not because we're stupid people. It's because there are behavioral reasons of like, I overestimate the, the present and underestimate the future. I don't like to look at things that provide anxiety, like all of these things just fed into this. And, and, and even though here, my brain knows if you just keep picking minimal payments, that capital isn't going to go anywhere. But my every month action was like, and then I was doing really dumb stuff. And then I would have like all of my money sitting in cash, like just I wasn't taking ownership the way I did with every other aspect of my money. So I had to do this autopsy that involved this Google spreadsheet. At the time, I was smoking cigarettes. So like, <laughs> like a pot of coffee and like a pack of cigarettes. And I was like, I'm just going to just going to see things the way they are. And I don't smoke anymore. Smoking is awful. So I don't recommend that as a financial strategy. But look, I was super anxious about looking at all these things. And so I did. And then from there, really started to devise a plan to attack it. First, I did the autopsy. And then this is the second part. You got to talk to somebody. So I did. I talked to the guy I was dating at the time, who is now my husband. And I was like, okay, this is my situation. And we knew we were going to like, we were going to be serious, which is another really, really important thing. If you know, you're going to be serious with somebody like, don't wait until the day before the wedding to talk about like your hot mess finance. Like, oh God, I'll have a moment before that. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, this is my whole situation. And he's like, yikes. But one of the things is he was a person that talked very openly about finances and the fact that he used to, on the side, even though he was at the UN, he was doing a lot of investments. And so that's why I brought it up to him because I was like, he seems to know what he's doing and he seems adept. And he helped me devise like a plan. And the plan wasn't complicated. The plan was literally like, what do you call it? Uh, avalanche method. Yeah. Pay your high interest things first. And, and don't even look at it. Just be like auto pay. And every time I get a bonus and every time just like boom, boom, just hit it, hit it, hit it. And shock of all friggin' shocks. Let me tell you, I managed somehow. I honestly don't know how paid off all of it within three years, three years. Yeah. Wow. I paid off all of it in three years. Part of that autopsy was finding other pockets of money. Like I found there had been this like random investment mutual fund that I just kind of ignored because it didn't really make many waves. And there's like a few ten thousands there. And it's like, okay, throw that at the debt. Yeah. Like it was about, and anytime I was able to do like a, a something on the side, I would, all of the extra cash would just go to the debt. I really focused on paying the debt. And I'm very, like I said, I'm not really a huge consumer. I've never had lifestyle creep, but if you're a person who has lifestyle creep, the second part of that equation is like cut down. So I just, I was just really intentionally, every single thought was ever, all of my money is going to go into that. And, and yeah, it was, I can't even tell you the day that that, that horrible little picture from like Sally Mae comes up and she's like, good job. <laughs> I like took a screenshot and I felt, <laughs> I felt like, I don't even know, like I could breathe for the first time since I started taking out student loans. So in 20 years, right? 2000s when I started uni, like it was the first time I could breathe. It was the first time I was free and then I could do whatever I want. I want to be a painter. Like I didn't have to do anything. And it's not that 
obviously I, I'm not I'm not fire yet, though I'm, I want to head in that direction. So I can't do anything I want forever as of right now. But I now know for a fact that if I strategize and I focus on it, I can actually like figure out how to get those numbers. And that is extremely freeing just to know, like, I don't have to do any particular thing for the rest of my life. Like if I don't want to, I just have to be strategic about it. It's there's so many things that we could pause on there, but there's a big one, almost like your mom in the life insurance is a critical moment walking up to Christopher Warren and just saying, explain this to me. And I feel like too often we don't do that. We stay quiet when, yes, when yes, some of the yes. biggest moments in my life were from mentorship. We're, we're, we're just, yes. just, and, and what's funny is you didn't even ask to get mentored. It sounded like he volunteered. I had electricians at my house yesterday helping me. Cause I can't figure out what's wrong with my ethernet. And the son of one of the electricians was here and he said, Hey, the last time we were here installing this, you said you had a podcast. What's it about? And then, so we started talking about money. He said, he said, well, I want to start investing in stocks, but I don't know how to do that. My dad and his dad was right there. He said, my dad said, that's a waste of money and I shouldn't do it. And I said, well, you should, but he had opened up a Robin hood account. So then we sit, we have this conversation and dad sat with us. And when they yeah. left our house, it was like this, we have this random conversation. Hopefully this kid changes and tomorrow he's investing in a yeah. responsible mutual fund or a exchange traded yeah. fund and getting rolling. But I think just asking that one little question is a huge moment that we can all do. Yeah. And, and so you're so, you know, what's amazing, right? What I'm, I'm now doing kind of like a retrospective of all of the big shifts in my life, everything, they stemmed from a conversation, that decision to move to Spain. I ran into a girlfriend at high school and she had just come back from like a summer in Spain and said, here's this program. This is the nineties. There was no internet. And she's like, this is the name of the program that I went with. Right. So you kind of have to open your mouth and you have to have the humility to ask for help. Like going to the guy that you're dating and being like, here's my Excel sheet of all of my financial mistakes is not <laughs> is not something a lot of people like to do but it really it actually was something a that i knew we needed to do is like look if you're gonna dump me for this like you might as well do it now <laughs> but also it turned out like he had great advice and was gonna hold me accountable right and that was the key thing because then i couldn't like bs myself and be like oh well maybe not this week because now he's like oh okay no this is like we have to deal with this situation and and I think that, yeah, you have to be curious and you have to be humble in everything. And, and those are going to be the opportunities that open themselves up. And like you just said, that moment with that young guy, I have a feeling in 10 years, he's going to say, well, that was the moment I, God, I, I started so. to really learn about money and, and change my entire life. And, and that's wonderful. Like, I think so often, and I'm sure you get this a lot with your audience, like people just think about money in terms of consumption yeah. and nothing could be further from the truth. Like money is, money is just money. Like who cares? Consumption is just consumption. Like what I'm really interested in is owning every single aspect of my life, owning all of it, bad or good. I had this, and I think that's what everybody wants. Yeah. I had the same conversation. You're not going to be surprised with our mutual friend, Michael Gilmore, and who wrote the little book, the Zen book of money. I want to play, by the way, he's the founder of the awards and you won two of them. I want to play just a little clip of what he told me recently about you. <laughs> so this is Michael Gilmore. Finding someone like Rosalia in these awards was just wonderful because yeah, she's going to, She's going to change the world. You'll realize that when you see her energy. She's going to change the world. He's, he, 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 he thinks small things about you. Small things. Yes. Yeah. But he I talks mean, about. He's totally right. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. Coming up next, you think that's a lot of adventure from Rosalia? Oh, no, it's not. There is much more to come on this special episode of Stacky Benjamins. We'll be right back. New Year's Day, 1960, Cardenas, Cuba. The sound of gunfire surrounds the Havana Club rum distillery. Inside, the workers freeze. Soldiers swarm. One soldier holds a gun to a man's head and barks, From now on, I'm the boss. This distillery no longer belongs to you. It belongs to the revolution, to Fidel Castro. It's 1983. Busy sidewalk in Burlington, Vermont. Crowds part as two hippies run past on their way to the local bank with a sheriff chasing them down. 
Local ice cream makers Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield need to withdraw the remaining cash before the sheriff seizes it and their ice cream dreams melt away. It's now 2010 and a series of deadly tragedies at factories in Bangladesh are drawing attention to the fast fashion industry. What lengths are they going to to keep up with customer demand? From Wondery, this is not another crime story, it's Business Wars, hosted by David Brown. Business Wars is an award-winning podcast that tells some of the greatest business feuds of our time. From the rum battle in Cuba in the season Bacardi versus Pernod Ricard, to Haagen-Dazs versus Ben & Jerry's, to a season focused on apparel brands like Zara, H&M, Topshop, and Forever 21, battling the fast fashion wars, they've made history-making rivalries sound like the stuff of Hollywood movies. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcast. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Well, you know there's always something new to try at Total Wine & More, and one of my favorite, favorite stops is always Total Wine & More. Nobody has a better selection of Italian wine than Total Wine & More. The new St. Giorgio Tuscan wines from the Castellani family, now available at Total Wine & More for 120 years The Castellani family has been dedicated to the craft of traditional Italian winemaking, producing these top quality wines for incredible value. Bottles start at just $9.99 and many are rated over 90. Their Vino Nobile rating a 96. Their Chianti Classico Reserva rating of 96. Their Toscana IGT Super Tuscan, yummy, rating of 97. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, always find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Drink responsibly, B21. This idea of mentorship is all over Bixie. So let's let's transition from your story now into Bixie, because this really is, in a lot of ways, a platform where women can mentor other women, yeah. where you can help each other. And you've got tools on there. You've got gamification, like all the behavioral yeah. stuff that people know is in Bixie. So tell me, walk me through Bixie. People may not have it open. So walk us through yeah. how, how does it work and, and what's this community about? Yeah. So shameless plug, go to our website, mybixie.com. You can download iOS and Android there. And I say this is a shameless plug because one of the things is you're already in this audience. So you're already curious. So that's half of the equation on the curious and humble. The second part is the humility to say, hmm, okay, maybe, maybe I'm actually going to like have to do something about it. And so Bixie, we call ourselves the financial home for women because I, myself, every woman, 99% of the women we know, so nine out of 10 women are in the same position and you will be shocked. I, investment bankers, like CEOs, you are, you are, I am consistently shocked at the women who like send me a message on the side after I have like an investor pitch and they're like, okay, I'm actually one of these people too. Like what do I do? It's shocking. We are just not in this framework. So statistically, in, in the Western world, so like in the U.S., the U.S. and in China, the numbers are a bit skewed, but it's still like 30 percent. So like three of if you're at a table, a, a dinner of 10 ladies tonight, because it's going to be Friday night, seven of them aren't doing anything. And they're just kind of like sitting there and they, they might be the smartest people in the room, the most ostensibly successful. So this was my experience. This is experience of every single, particularly millennial woman I know. And by the way, millennials, we're not young anymore. We are 42 now. So like, we're not kids anymore. That's for Gen Z. So I started to really notice that this is a problem. And then I I went to the market and I started just doing like, large scale focus groups and key informant interviews on, on, on with experts. And it actually turned out the problem was like, really global and like really vast and particularly for female millennials we have the kind of the double whammy of most of us aren't getting married and not having kids and if we do it's way later and so why this is a double whammy is because that used to be part of the social security system around you so we as a generation are 80 percent more likely to retire in poverty and this is regardless of our background and education that is terrifying and i know a lot of listeners are like That sounds a bit odd, but really ask yourself, like if you're a mid thirties person listening in right now, ask yourself, look around your consultancy firm, look around your law firm and ask yourself, Hey, if my working life technically is going to end in 30 years, am I going to have enough money at my current expense rate for the next 30 years? Because life expectancy is going up. And like, there are very few of you that are going to be like, 
I'm fine. Very few. If you are not actively investing, it is almost impossible. We don't have the pensions of our friends, the boomers, right? The pensions and the million dollar houses that they bought for $10. Like we just don't have any of those luxuries. So creating Bixie was really about creating a journey tailored to us and the challenges that we face. But more importantly, asking the why. Why is it that a group of brilliant women with PhDs, MBAs, whatever, like, why aren't they doing the most obvious thing that in theory would optimize their gains? That's like economist talk for why aren't you doing the thing in your best interest, right? It actually turns out, so I went to the LSE and this was the early 2000s. And I happened to be in the first year course where they started this like burgeoning school of thought called behavioral economics, which was a mix between psychology and economics. So it was like this notion that we are seeing that for certain things, people regularly choose the worst option for them. So it's no longer sufficient to just say, oh, well, they're being irrational actors. That's, that's not sufficient anymore. And some of these things are smoking cigarettes, buying gym memberships, like really banal examples, but they extend to other things. So basically I was already primed to when I interact with a group of people who are doing the worst possible thing for them, despite the fact of information flows and being knowledgeable, clearly there's something behavioral growing on. And that is exactly what was happening with women. So there's a few unique things like women and men interact with money differently. So there's some research that kind of points to some of these behavioral distinctions were like articulated in our cave days. Like you guys went hunting and we had to figure out how to like resource distribute regardless of seasonality. Like, so some of these roles were just like fixed over like for hundreds of years. Right. So I'm not saying that they, they can't be undone, but they've just been handed over in their, their behavioral traits. So one thing is like women lack confidence because they lack what they think is financial literacy. So the actual numbers are, if you look at men and women testing on the global metrics, the GFLEC for financial literacy, women only are like two standard deviation points below men, right? So nothing, nothing significant. But when you ask them, like, how do you feel about your financial literacy? Like, I don't know anything. So it's classic imposter syndrome versus like Dunder-Kruger effect, right? Like yeah. if you ask the average guy, it's like, well, I'm basically a crypto expert. And you're like, you've been on YouTube this weekend for three hours. <laughs> it's all confidence. It's all confidence. Because most of life is confidence, right? So women, so part of the thing is we need to build this confidence. We need to make them feel like they're learning more. Even if they don't technically need to learn more, they just need to build that confidence by having more knowledge. Another really key distinction between men and women, we mitigate our financial risk by talking to other women, not financial experts. So this is really key. This is, this is that like cave stuff, right? Like we're all sitting around the cave. What this actually means is the blind are leading the blind. So like my mother, who luckily had a friend who said the right thing, we also fall into traps of saying the wrong things to each other. Where it's like, what are you doing to invest? I just bought an apartment on, at like a 12% mortgage. Ooh, that sounds great. I'll do the same thing. That is how we tend to make decisions related to money. And if I have a moment for like an anecdote of this, one of now Bixie's investors who I was pitching to at the time, he was a senior, super fancy banker out of Hong Kong. And when I mentioned this point, he starts laughing because his aunt had recently, his aunt in India had recently died and her husband had left her quite a formidable estate, right? So he's like, oh, I'll fly in and I'm, I'm an expert. Like, I'm going to help you do all of this. And she's like, no, no, no. I'm going to go talk to my friends and we're going to figure out our own plan. Like her other widower friends. So she said like, no to fancy guy does private wealth management for the, and she's like, I'm good. I'm just going to go talk to my homegirls down the street and we're going to like come up with our own plan. And that is just so like, that's such a woman way of, of addressing money. And there are myriad other behavioral distinctions, but those are the things that we take into account at Bixie. So the thing that we kept hearing in all of the focus groups that we got was, I know I need to do something about my money. I just don't know what. And so the idea is to create a user journey where you don't really have to think so much about what. So you come into Bixie, you take a quick diagnostic. We set up like a program for you. It's like, okay, based on what you want to achieve, here's how you can do it. Very much, very task oriented. Gamification does wonders to overcome like misconceptions and misperceptions that are inherent to like be be suboptimal behaviors. So we play along with that. So they come in, they do this, they get knowledge first, and then they get network. So that's that, that second part that really like moves women along. So once they like feel like, okay, I think I know something, then I can go and talk to other people 
in a non-embarrassed manner about like, how are you guys doing with your taxes or how are you guys doing things with starting a business? And they can have those conversations. And we really focus on building online and offline community because women are what are called high touch audience. So robo advisors are not going to work. And then once they're feeling comfortable and connected, then it's time to show them, hey, these financial products might work for you. And that's that last step. It's kind of like Netflix recommended for you, right? And so a lot of people, depending on who comes in, some people come in more aggressive than others, but the vast majority are going to start somewhere along insurance or they're going to start somewhere along like micro investments just to start. And then you can kind of build your way up. When I started doing my investment stuff, how I started was basically what's the amount of money I could stand to lose? And I would start there right? That's just the amount of money I'm comfortable with. And then you kind of, part of behavioralism is like, you have to build your muscle. And then eventually, as you're getting more and more comfortable, you're like, okay, I understand there's ebbs and flows in a market and, and I can go with that. So I think overall, like what we focus on is really trying to get people to feel comfortable, get people knowledge up. And then we work with financial service providers to provide only products that align with women's values. So things like women actually tend to not necessarily care as much about ROI than on buying products that are like good for the world, right? So you know, trying to sell them like, I don't know, <laughs> weapons, arms, stocks is not going to go as well as if you're like, it's a green company, et cetera, regardless of the ROI. So just making sure that they're, that, that they have products that and services that reflect what they want. If you know that behaviorally, I'm going to get advice from other women and I'm going to get advice from my community. Why wouldn't you join a community where those people can be like your Christopher Warren? You know what I mean? A community that had those people in it. So it's your community, but luckily it's a community with smart people in it that can lead you the right yeah. way. Yeah. And I think this is also one of the things is this is not specific to women. This is a generational distinction, and I'm sure you're seeing it as well. I mean, your podcast is evidence of that. Finance is, is revolutionizing. The days of trusting an anonymous institution that's FDIC insured with all of your money is eroding. I mean, that was the gap that, that created the trillion dollar crypto industry, right? Yeah, yeah. Consumers, myself, we expect more from banks. Like we expect community, we expect connectedness, we expect it to reflect our values. This is where like the world changing stuff for not only at Bixie, but a, a number of other kind of financial apps, particularly for women or those who are traditionally marginalized. The world changing part comes as we accrue more users and are able to develop our offerings more. Like we are looking at changing completely how people interact with money. Like I, the, again, people are going to be expecting that their bank has people that they can talk to, that they can relate to, that they can ask questions to, as opposed to just getting a, a terrifyingly frustrating response of like, sorry, no, press one for whatever. And then I'm going to take money from your bank account every month because you have a checking account. Like none of this is necessary anymore. The technology doesn't permit it and the audience won't accept it. So it's going to be really interesting to watch like digital community banking completely disrupt this traditional banking model because even I see this across particularly the developing world where the there's already so little trust in traditional banking institutions. They're already migrating towards crypto and crypto is a proxy for just community like they're migrating towards look, I trust these guys more. They seem more like my kind of people. They connect more to what I'm after. And frankly, all the bankers in my country, like there's bank runs and nobody can trust them. So this is a better bet for me. We used um, to, we used to focus in the early days, what, 13 years ago when we started the podcast, the first couple of years, far more facts and numbers and education. Yeah. And the longer we do this, the more it's about stories, it's about community, yeah. it's about learning from each other's mistakes, stories about yeah. mistakes I made and holes I stepped in. It's funny that you talk about people with distrust of banks. I was just doing some research and reading a McKinsey report from last year about the state of global banking. And it's, and it's so interesting that banks really – so stayed and going nowhere. Their stock prices are going nowhere. Their growth prospects, not big. And yet 
in the world of fintech where I meet founders like you who are about community, who are about revolution, who are excited about this versus what banks are talking about now. Banks, by the way, according to this McKinsey report, are about how do I make more money per customer? I'm not growing more. I'm not getting closer to my customer. I'm not helping people learn how this works. I want to see if I can make more money per customer. And we should all be horrified when we hear that because, yeah. because there's nothing about relationship, about trust, about any of this in there. It's all about just how do I get deeper in your pocket, which yeah. is, which is why FinTech is growing and Bixie yeah. is growing and winning all these awards and Bank of America is not. Well, so I learned everything about the future of fintech when I had a very bizarre and fortuitous time when I worked in China. <laughs> so talk about a left turn. Don't even ask me. I do not speak Chinese. So it was after I left the UN and I, I was like, okay, I'm going to get a join entrepreneurialism. I want to learn at new modern ways of dealing with money, fell into fintech, fell into blockchain, worked at the blockchain company, and then was recruited by an investor to work at, they were going to head a team working at Alibaba in China. And she was like, do you want to come with? And I'm like, that sounds like an interesting adventure. And this is where I learned, I don't know for your listeners who've ever been to China or know anything about China. China is truly the global leader on FinTech. They have been doing swipe payments, Venmo type things since like the early 2000s. Like, this is, like none of this stuff is new. They really are considered the global lead and everybody kind of copies from them, right? So the Chinese business model is everything is a fintech, everything. Your podcast could be a bank tomorrow, right? The only thing holding it back is a regulatory license. You're building, you're putting people on, on a platform. If they have cash circulating, so if you had like a newsletter where, you know, or a, a Patreon, there's some form of cash circulating. They trust you and they trust each other because a bank really is, all a bank is, is money put together in a pot and then you're licensed to basically only house 10% of it inside of your bank, right? Those are your reserves. And 90% of it you lend out. And you lend that out at a percentage. And that's how you make money out of money. Like, that's the big mystery. And so every company in China knows that. And they're like, you could have cups, books. There was a very famous bicycle company. It's, it's like City Bike in New York. And they were actually, so everybody's like, oh, it's like a bike company. And it's like, no, it's one of the biggest fintechs in the world. They, they use, so like everybody has to have the deposit for the bicycle, right? And so they use all, they have a billion people getting a bike. So you have a dollar from a billion people, you have a billion dollars. You're lending that out. You're, you're bringing it back. That's a, that's a bank, right? So like everything is a bank and or everything has the potential to be a bank. And I think that is one of the things that is really disruptive about the future of finance. So everything has the potential to be a bank. You can platform anything, coupled with the fact that blockchain technology, for all of its faults, like forget crypto, all that crap, just the blockchain technology, like there literally is no reason why I have to pay transfer fees on the SWIFT network. Like there's just no reason. So the technology plus coupled with the fact that like everything is a fintech, coupled with the fact that like just socially, generationally, this is the expectation from the end user, you are kind of getting to a point where banking from the 1600s is just not, no longer going to apply moving forward. And, and so I think that's why a lot of fintechs are really excited. That's why a lot of all of the fintechs from traditional to, to DeFi are really excited because they know, they know it's really just a matter of time. You hope that you're not too early. You remember like the first dot, yeah. dot com craze. You hope yeah. you're the second one, right? Yeah. But it, it really is just a matter of time. I have no doubt that I have, I have an 18 month old and I'm about to have two more children right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm pregnant with twins. Hello. You have twins on the way. <laughs> I, have, I, I, I have twins. Oh, really? Yes, that's where I, my hair went. I have no hair because of, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I should, I'm hold on to this. Enjoy your hair now, uh, Rosalia. <laughs> I'm going to hold on. Yeah, I have, I have twin girls on the way, and, and I have really no doubt that they are not going to, they're going to be like, what's a bank? Like, you gave a bunch of people your money, and they took your money, and they didn't give you any money. That That's not a business model that's going to sustain itself with a completely different career trajectory. And I just think, and, I, and we're seeing that writing on the wall already. We're seeing a lot of banks trying to be like community. Yeah, you, you've seen like some of these like awkward uncle interactions. It's not a, the problem is it's not a cosmetic fix, right? It's not a marketing fix. It's a behavioral fix yeah. because yeah. the audience expects something so different. That's why Robin Hood exists, right? Like it's not, it's not cosmetic. 
I would love it if everybody goes and checks out Bixie, the women in our audience. It is free. It is free. And the men. We're not not exclusive. (laughs) It is free to join, right? It is free. It is free. So we started in the Philippines. So we have our app launched in the Philippines. We're coming to Thailand. But you'll still be able to see the gamification stuff. You'll still be able to connect with community. The financial products also have, they have to be licensed. So you will not see financial products if you're tuning in from the US. But at the very least, I, I always think of every moment as an opportunity. If you're listening to this podcast, you care about your money situation. Let this be the moment when you're like, look, I'm just going to do something about it today. And the first thing we, off- we ask all users to do on our platform after the diagnostic is we tell them they have to take their Bixi number. And the Bixi number is kind of a hack on a fire number. And I think I am appalled that nobody, de- how did I go to universities, all the universities, and like nobody had me sit down and like write down the number, the amount of money I would need to never have to work again a day in my life. If you don't honestly know that number right now, Man or woman, drop whatever you're doing, download the Bixie app, take the number, because that number sits on a post-it in front of my desk every day. That is the number I'm working towards, because maybe I want to, like, take up synchronized swimming in my 50s. I'm not sure. But, like, you you should really, like, if and it doesn't matter how old you are, you need to know what that number is. Otherwise, we're walking aimlessly through life. We had a wonderful guest on recently. She goes by the name Miss Be Helpful, you know, Lee Espinal. She was talking about if we just had a syllabus, it is so mind blowing as I'm listening to you talk about, hey, you need this number, but it's the thing we don't teach. And it's the thing that's fundamental to everything else. Like you said, it's not cosmetic. This is this is fundamental. This is behavioral. Yeah. And it just the education system on this. That's a whole nother hour. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link to Bixie in the show notes and I'd love everybody to go and, and check it out. I wish you were passionate about this. I so I so I so wish that you had some passion about teaching people more about money and having them do better. Thanks for helping. Yeah, our, I hate it. <laughs> thanks for helping our stacker community get better at this. I'm more than happy to. I'm extremely passionate about people figuring out how to own their lives. Like I said, <laughs> I was 14 years old with $200 in my pocket. Like I know what it's like to have to figure it out, to have to do it alone. And there are ways that you don't have to do it. One of them is joining this community, the stackers community. That's a great first step. Another one is download the Bixie app. There's so many tools now, like you cannot continue to just live in blissful ignorance. Like so many of us have done like that is, that's the only thing you're not supposed to don't do everything else. You have your choice, but don't do nothing. Inaction is absolutely not the way to go. And yeah, I'm really passionate about this because because it can change your life and you can actually live like a happy, fulfilled life on a beach house in Thailand. I mean, like all of this is awaiting now you're, for Now you. you're rubbing it in. Now you're rubbing it in. <laughs> or in Texarkana, people. Or in Texarkana. Or that. This is Rebecca from Connecticut. Instead of stacking Hamiltons and Jacksons, I'd much rather be stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Rosalia, oh chief, for hanging out with me. Going up to your professor, who happened to be one of the U.S. secretaries of state, and saying, how did you do that? Like for me, that's kind of, that's a huge key in life is just asking the question. And I, and by the way, I don't do it a lot. There's a lot of times when I, I'm like, no, I don't think, I I think I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to, but you know what? If you never ask somebody And the fact that Christopher Warren became her mentor, imagine a former secretary of state's your mentor and you're somebody that uh, had the childhood that she had. Pretty powerful. As I say, I'm thinking about some people know my after school activity in the fall that I do and the career trajectory of that is largely determined by obviously how good you are at the task, but also your networking. And networking can sound a lot like the slimy, you know, when you hear, sometimes you hear the word networking, you go, uh, I don't want to go to a networking event. I'm going to a chamber of commerce networking event. You just go, Ugh. but networking is, is really your network, right? It's like the people that, you know, the people that know you and how you can help them and how they can help you and being okay with being open about, you know, here's a, here's a question that I have, or here's an opportunity that I don't know how to handle. How can I, put my best foot forward and participate in this? Or how can I, how can I learn from this experience or something and being rather unapologetic, right? About 
being vulnerable enough to just say, I don't, I, I, I want to do that. Like, how do I do what you're doing? Cause I'm, imp- you know, we don't have any issues with asking people how to make a really good chocolate cake, right? It's like, man, I had that. That was amazing. How do you do that? But then you see somebody that's su- successful with money or business or career or whatever it is. And you go, well, I can't, I, he, she doesn't want to be bothered. He doesn't want to be bothered with that. It's like, well, no, that person probably is successful because of the things that you're doing that you want to do to be successful too. So people love helping people. Well, yeah. And somebody helped them. Yeah. Like I think the older you get, the more you realize that you're not an island. You didn't do all this by yourself. People helped you and now you want to turn and help other people. And to your point, just the fact that she didn't lead with all the cool things she was doing at that time, she led with Mr. Warren or professor Warren, I guess at the time, how did you do this? How did you Mm -hmm. do that? This stuff? She asked him a simple question about him, not about her, but the, like the one thing I hate when you said chamber of commerce meetings, like if anybody's been to those, you know, it's full <laughs> yeah, of people totally going, like, let me tell you about me, 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 yeah. I'm just going to tell you about me. I don't care. Oh yeah. Tell me about you. And then you can see them glaze off. Right. Cause they're not there to yeah. network. They're there to slime you with all the crap that they're working on. So I think that's powerful. Now, what about the, I, I thought the part where, you know, Warren tells her to work do these government things, work at the United Nations, like do these things that really get the word out about who you are and then cash in second. And maybe that's not a career path for everybody. Go join the government first and then private sector second. But I will say this, I thought there's a correlation when I was listening to her that for the average person out there, I see too many 25 year olds trying to make a bajillion dollars and turning down some pretty crappy jobs. When a lot of time those crappy jobs give you the insight and the ability to be a better leader later. Where do you come down on that? Well, I guess I just don't think that any job is crappy. You have to decide how you interpret anything that's going on in your life, whether it's a, it's a learning, you know, a lesson. Uh, but if you say, if, if you're thinking like, well, I, this, this thing is beneath me, which is kind of what you're intimating here about, you know, having the crappy job, like I'm better than that. Right. Like, no, well, good point. I mean, yes, you're not better than that. It's just, it's just work. You know, um, so I don't think that anything is necessarily good or bad. It's just, it's just, how are you going to learn something from this experience? I mean, I look back quite a bit at the upbringing that I had relative to money and responsibility and entrepreneurship. And I've worked some pretty crappy jobs, (laughs) you know, like I did dishes at a chicken restaurant. Like it sucked. It was awful but it was a short period of time so that I could move into the next thing, which was the thing I wanted to do was be in the consumer facing type stuff. And it was just a process that they at that organization made you go through so that you learned all of the things. There weren't any servers who were jerks to the cooks because guess what? They were cooks at one point in time too. There were no management that was jerks to the dishwashers because at one point in time they washed dishes also. And remembered, yeah, that sucks. That's a big pot of nasty potatoes that you need to scrub out. Here, let me give you a hand. Well, I guess just chasing experience for me, well, bigger than chasing yeah, money. that's the biggest thing. You know, maybe if I can get experience and money at the same time, that's great. But I'll take experience over money, especially in my 20s. 100 times out of 100. Well, thanks again to Rosalia for joining us. What a great time. Uh, hey, just a couple things before we say goodbye on today's uh, special episode on the community calendar coming up tomorrow. I will be on Instagram with Christina Roman from Experian. Come talk credit with us tomorrow, 5 PM Eastern, 2 PM Pacific. Love to hang out with you and with Christina and let's talk about credit. You can have all your credit questions answered and we'll have, we'll have some fun there with Christina. If you're not here for fun, you're not here to be inspired. You're here, though, because you need to make better decisions about your money. OG and his team are taking clients and would be happy to talk to you about how their team can help you and your team go faster, go better, make better decisions for your future. Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG to get to his team's calendar. All right, that's going to do it for today's special episode. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, find stories that inspire you. Rosalia's story should help you get started so you'll be on your way to financial success. 
Second, who are your mentors? Emulate Rosalia's success by asking someone for help who's already been where you're trying to go. But the big lesson? Yeah, probably not as good of an idea as I thought to podcast in the basement with scented candles. That sea salt, sandal, wood, sport, rush smell. I mean, that sticks around. Next time, windows open. Thanks to Rosalia Gital for joining us today. You can find out more about her work at mybixie.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of the Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. The Bulwark Podcast focuses on political analysis and reporting without partisan loyalties. Real sense of deja vu sprinkled on our PTSD. So things are going well, I guess. Every Monday through Friday, Charlie Sykes speaks with guests about the latest stories from inside Washington and around the world. You document in a very compelling way all of the positive things that have come out of this, but it also feels like we have this massive hangover. No shouting or grandstanding. Principles over partisanship. The Bulwark Podcast, wherever you listen.